Morning, everybody. Thank you. It is great to be back here with you, my Cedar Creek Church family, whether that's here at our Banksville campus, you're up at our Ridge campus, or watching online either way. I'm just so excited to be back. I think probably you guys know Terry and I had an opportunity to get away for a couple of days for our annual summer vacation. Those of you that know our family know we do our Lee family vacation at Christmas, and that's all the kids, grandkids, big group. But summer vacation, it's just me and mama, right? And uh, we kind of have a, a goal, a purpose with our summer vacation. For us, it's not really about where we're going. It's all about what is the temperature going to be where we're going. We are always chasing 70 degrees, something cool, something refreshing. Uh, it seems like we have to keep going further and further north to get that. But we're, a, a successful summer vacation for us means that at, at least one night of the vacation, we have to put on a sweater or a light jacket. I guess you could say we are going on vacation to chill, like literally chill. And we're kind of strategic in how we do this summer vacation. We always try to schedule it at about the halfway point in the summer. And we do that for a reason. One is we want to have some time to recover from the heat that we've been in in the first part of the summer to kind of renew and refresh. But we also kind of want to store up some of that good, cool feeling in our bones to get us through the second half of the summer that we're going to be facing between now and probably be Christmas before it cools off again. But we love getting away. We love being renewed and refreshed. And I was thinking about that this week, and I thought, you know, that's kind of what corporate worship is all about. When you think about it, when we gather here on Sunday mornings as a church family, we kind of gather to be renewed, to refresh, to recover from all that we've been through in this past week, but we also kind of want to get charged up and ready to face whatever is going to come our way in this next week. But what's interesting about worship is the way that it renews and recharges us. It, it's not from coming in here focusing on ourselves what we want, what we think we need, what songs we want, what we want to hear. We're refreshed by worship, by focusing on who our God is. That no matter what we're dealing with, no matter what's going on in the culture, in the country, and the world, we can get our eyes on the sovereign God who is a good, good Father, the Prince of Peace, the name above every name. And we begin to recalibrate our mind, our hearts, and our lives through worship. I think as Pastor Rick defined it a couple of weeks ago when we kicked off this series, that worship is about ascribing ultimate value and worth to God. Unfortunately, we tend to ascribe ultimate value and worth sometimes to things other than God. And Rick talked about that being a form of modern day idolatry. When we look to ourselves or our circumstances or our bank account or our politicians for that peace and stability. But really worship is about making God the focal point of everything in me and everything happening around me. We also discovered that worship is not simply a weekly event. It's not just a service we attend or the songs we sing in that service. That worship is ultimately a lifestyle. It's how we live our lives. Actually living and treating and interacting with each other and with people as if God really was the focal point of my life. I really love the way Jesus puts it in Mark 12. Listen to what Jesus says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor 
as yourself. I would imagine for most of you, if you've been around church for any length of time, you're familiar with those words of Jesus. We call those words the great commandment. But do you know why we call those words of Jesus the great commandment? It's because Jesus spoke them in answer to a question, what is the greatest commandment? A teacher of the law asked Jesus, and all these hundreds of commands and laws in the book of Moses, all these book of Leviticus, all these things we're supposed to do to honor you, to love you, to worship you, what is the most important? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as your Self. But that was not the first time those words had been spoken. When Jesus speaks those words, did you know he's actually quoting from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That prayer, that passage, was known as the Shema prayer. And every Jew from the first century, even today, if you have any friends that are Jewish and are devoutly Jewish, they begin each day with that Shema prayer and they end each day with that Shema prayer. It's a recalibrating. It's starting the day and ending the day being reminded that our God is God, the one God, and that we are to love him with our heart soul, mind, and strength. But what I want you to notice about the Shema, or as we call it, the great commandment, is the holistic nature of it. Did you notice that? It's like with everything, right? With your heart, with your soul, with your mind, with your physical strength, in the way that you treat others. Worship of God is a holistic expression of everything that we have. See, worship is not merely an intellectual exercise. It's not just singing the right songs about God or or reading in the Bible and learning about who God is. But worship is also not simply an emotional exercise. It's not just about emotionally, at a heart level, connecting with God. Worship is not just about obeying God and doing the things He's called us to do. In fact, worship is not even just about being kind to the people around us. Worship is about honoring God with all of those things all of the time, right? To live that way with all of me, loving and honoring God all of the time. That concept has been described as worshiping God with my head, my heart, and my hands. With the way I think, with the way I feel, with the things I do. The problem is we all have a tendency to be naturally bent towards one of those things more than the other right? Let's take a quick survey. How many of you tend to be thinkers? You love to study, you love to analyze, you love to take notes during the sermon. Let me see all of my thinkers, my analytical. Yes, that's Rick's crowd. Y'all remember a couple of weeks ago, Rick said we ought to preach for an hour, sing a doxology and go home. No emotions, no feeling, right? Some of you are that way and it's okay. How many of you are feelers? Like for you, it ain't worship till somebody cries or shouts or claps. Let me see my feelers, my heart, people. Yes, you're awesome. We're glad you're here as well. Okay, we got thinkers. We got feelers. How about the doers? You're like, let's quit singing about it and talking about it. Let's get out there and do it. How many of you are doers? Like you don't want to change the world. That's awesome. And I don't know if you notice, I can see it from up here. And I don't know about the ridge, but I bet it's the same. Pretty evenly divided. In fact, that's one of the reasons I believe that Cedar Creek Church is such an incredibly healthy church because God has blessed us with all these different types. And guess what? You are the way you are. Because God made you that way. When he knit you together in your mother's womb, he created some of you to be thinkers and some of you to be feelers and some of you to be doers, right? 
And so worship, worshiping with all that you have, is not about changing who you are. It's about adding depth and layers to who you are. It's about learning to take next steps and growing in your faith journey and your worship of God in ways that maybe don't come quite as natural to you as others do. So here's what I want to do this morning for the next few minutes. I want to look at three examples of people in the New Testament who were a little out of balance in the way that they lived out worship. They lived out worship in some ways, but not in all of the ways. And what you're going to see is all three of these people we're going to look at, they all have a desire to honor God, right? We're not talking about pagans. We're not talking about bad people. We're talking about people who desired to honor God. And they wanted to honor God with all that they did. But they actually end up only honoring God in some areas, but not in all. And as we're going to see, that resulted in some negative impacts in their life and some negative impacts in the life of people around us. So we're going to be talking about moving towards a more balanced life of worship. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have a tendency to just think of yourself in, as one of these three people. You're going to like, yeah, I'm like this guy. Or, no, I'm like this guy. Or, no, I have a tendency to be. But the truth is we're all like all three of these people at different times and in different circumstances. So what I want you to do is see a little bit of yourself in all three of these people. Make sense? All right, let's jump in. Well, the first thing we do sometimes is we worship God with our head and our hands, but not our hearts. We worship God with our head and our hands, but not our heart. We know the right things and we do the right things. We just don't have the right heart. Anybody want to guess uh, somebody, a group of people in the New Testament that represent this? Like they know everything about God and they obey all the laws of God, but they're really kind of rotten in the heart. You can shout it out. Who am I talking about? Pharisees, right? The religious leaders of Jesus' day. And I want you to look at what Jesus says to them in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence, right? Just like, you know, you look good on the outside, you do all the right things, but you're doing them for the wrong reason. You got the wrong motivation. Your heart is not in the right place. Now, here's the thing. In the modern church today, and those of us that are preachers are probably responsible for this, but we have a tendency to lump all of the Pharisees into one bucket, right? We think these are all bad guys. They're all corrupt. They're just doing it not because they love God. They're just doing it because they want, you know, to make money or to have power or to have fame. But the truth is that's not true of all of the Pharisees all of the time. Right, Nicodemus, you might remember him. Right, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of teachers high up in the religious order. And yet he was a genuine seeker after Jesus. In fact, he helped Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body off the cross when he died and help place him and anoint him when they put him in the tomb. See, here's what I believe. Most Pharisees, most of these religious leaders in the first century they had a genuine desire to honor God, or at least they started out that way. And here's why I say that, because becoming a Pharisee was not an easy thing. If a young man wanted to pursue that, it required incredible discipline, sacrifice of your own desires. It was a lot of hard work. Yeah, maybe a few of them made it to the top and got paid or had power, but most of them were just genuine people trying to honor God with their lives. In fact, if you read all of Matthew 25, Matthew 25 is the chapter where Jesus sort of goes through this long list of all the issues he has with the Pharisees and religious leaders. And, and look at what he says at the beginning. Before he goes into all these woe to you, all these bad things, look at what he says. Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3. 
The teachers of religious law, he's saying this to the people. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. You understand what Jesus is saying? These guys have the right beliefs. Their head's in the right place. And they have the right behaviors. They are obedient in what they do. The problem is the heart's a little disconnected. Any chance that might be happening somewhere in your life, in the way that you worship? Could could there be a chance that maybe you're doing the right things and you're thinking the right way? but you're just kind of going through the motions? Does that happen sometimes when you gather here for corporate worship? When you sing the songs, maybe you raise your hands, but really your heart is disconnected. You're feeling something different inside than you are expressing outside. Or how about this? How about when you serve others, right? When you honor God with your hands, maybe you serve in a kid's creek or a greeter or somewhere out in the community. When you serve, is it possible that sometimes, maybe some weeks, it's a little bit about how it makes you look or how it makes you feel? You're serving because you want people to say, oh, look, he's a good guy. She's a good girl. They're sacrificial, servant-hearted people. Or how about this? How about the way you view the people in the culture around us, the non-believers? When when you look at the people who are in full-on rebellion to God, disrespecting everything that's holy and sacred to you, how do you see them? Do you see them with anger? Do you want to just swat them or blow them up on Facebook? Do you think that's how Jesus sees them? The Bible says that one day Jesus was standing on a hilltop overlooking the city of Jerusalem, crowded with people, right, who were not doing the right thing. They were living in sin. They were just, it was bad. It was bad. And the Bible doesn't say Jesus saw that and pulled out his Facebook and blew them up, right? You know what the Bible said? Jesus saw him. He had compassion. You know why he had compassion? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were people who were living by a truth that wasn't true. They were people who had no purpose, no hope beyond themselves. They were just living their truth and living the lies that the enemy had told them. And Jesus wasn't angry. He was heartbroken for them. Does your heart break for the things that break God's heart? Or do you just get angry? Just get afraid that you're losing control of your world. Your heart matters. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, writes this, Proverbs 4. Above all else, guard your heart. Why? Everything you do flows from it. It's got to start with the heart. It's no surprise to me that when Moses wrote the Shema prayer and when Jesus quoted it in the great commandment, that he said, love the Lord your God first with your heart. It has to start in your heart. You want to live a life of worship? You got to be willing to engage your heart. Now, look, I'm not telling you you need to automatically turn into some mushy, ushy, gushy, touchy-feely person that needs to cry during a song every Sunday or run up and down the aisles waving a flag. I'm not telling you to not be what God created you to be. I'm just saying, check your heart. Make sure your heart is in the right place. Number two, the second example we see is when I worship with my heart and my hands, but no head. With my heart and my hands, but no head. You look like in the uh, opening of the Olympic ceremony. What was it? Marie Antoinette with holding her head in the box, you know, there singing. You know, you got no head. In other words, you act first and think later. I'm talking about those times when our passions override wisdom. When we make commitments without counting the cost. We're impulsive. We're led by how we feel. Anybody you can think of in the New Testament 
that was kind of impulsive like that? I'll give you a hint. It's one of Jesus' closest followers. Who am I talking about? Huh? The fisherman jumps out of the boat, always saying something. It starts with a P, P P-E-T-E-R. Who am I talking about? Peter, right, Simon? Peter is a great example, especially in the early years, prior to the resurrection. See, think about Peter. If something needed to be said, he was going to be the first one to jump up and say it. But the problem was, if something didn't need to be said, he was also going to be the first one to jump up and say it, right? He jumps out of the boat to walk on water. He's the first one to pull a sword and defend Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. The problem was, those weren't the right things to do. And what's really cool is if you read Matthew chapter 16, you get this great both side picture of Peter, how his impulsive lead from the heart is good, but you also see an example of how it can lead him astray. Matthew 16 begins with Jesus asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? Right? What's the word on the street? What are people saying about me. And you know their answer, whether you're a prophet, you're Elijah, come back, you're John the Baptist, return from the dead. And then Jesus says, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, immediately, you are the Lord, the Messiah, the Son of the Most High God. And Jesus says, oh, Simon, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my spirit And you will no longer be called Simon the fisherman, but now you are Peter, Petra, the rock. And on this rock, I'll build my kingdom. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Like, way to go, Peter. And in the very next breath, Jesus explains to them, as the Messiah, I have to go to Jerusalem where I'm going to be suffered. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be put in a grave. And Peter impulsively pulls Jesus aside and said, don't talk like that, Lord. It's not going to happen on my watch. And notice Jesus' response to this, Matthew 16, 23. Jesus turned and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. And this is so interesting. And I'd never really noticed this until I was preparing for this message this week. The fact that Jesus uses the phrase, have in mind. Peter, you do not have in mind the things of God. What you have in mind are the things that are of you. What you want, what you desire. And I think that is the problem when we are led by the heart, when we only are led by our emotions, right? It becomes about what I think, what I feel, what I want instead of the things of God. If I'm led by my emotions, I will often end up where I want to be, but I will eventually discover it's not really the best place for me to be. That's why the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah said, don't follow the heart. The human heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can even understand it, right? And I I see this so much, even more and more in our culture today. Follow your heart. You got a decision to make? Follow your heart. Go with your gut, right? Live your truth. And if you've been living that way, can I just say, I love you. Please, 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 don't, don't. It may lead you where you want to be in the moment, but in the long term, it's going to hurt. It's going to damage your life and the lives of the people around you. Now look, that doesn't mean that our emotions are bad. It doesn't mean that you touchy-feely heart people need to turn into some kind of deep thinking stoics. It just simply means understand the role of emotions in your life. You have emotions because God gave you emotions. You're created in His image. He is emotional. Jesus wept. Jesus felt compassion. Jesus laughed. Jesus experienced all the emotions that all of us do. But understand the role of your emotions. God gave them to you to help you experience life as you go through, to feel it. 
but they were never meant to be the guide for your life. I love what Jesus says to the Samaritan woman at the well. John chapter four, Jesus says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. You see what he's saying? Jesus is saying that true worship requires God's spirit in us. When you commit to follow Christ in your life, the Bible says God pours out his spirit into you and God's Holy Spirit. It's what changes your heart to give you the right heart. And it's God's Holy Spirit that gives you the strengths in your hands to serve and love other people, to live out the gifts that he's given you. But he also says you have to worship in truth. What your heart feels and your hands want to do must be filtered through the truth of God's word. And actually, you get to see this in Peter's life post-resurrection. After Jesus is raised from the dead, the day of Pentecost, Peter and all the other followers of Jesus are in an upper room. God pours out his Holy Spirit. It falls on all of them. They take to the streets and they start sharing the gospel, the message of Jesus in the streets of Jerusalem. And since it's a festival week, the place is packed with people who come from all over the world. And all of these followers of Jesus are speaking in Aramaic, which is the language they spoke, but all the people are hearing it in their own heart language. There are these tongues that they're hearing it. It's, it's a miraculous moment. And it's this chaotic, streets are filled, mob type moment. And some people look at the followers of Jesus and say, them fools are drunk. Look at how they're doing. And Peter said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Peter jumps up. First one to say it. They're not drunk. It's just nine o'clock in the morning. They are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And then he begins to tell everyone about Jesus. But guess where he starts? Peter doesn't start with what he knows or he feels or he thinks. He starts in God's word. He goes back to the Old Testament prophecy of Jesus coming, and he filters what he says through the unchanging truth of God's word, not just his opinion or what his impulsive emotions are leading him to do. So let me ask you, if you kind of look at your life right now, is there some place where it could be that your heart is running ahead of your mind? right, that your emotions are trumping the truth of what you know to be in God's Word, right? Maybe it's a lifestyle. You live in this continuous life. You know it's in direct opposition to God's Word, but it just feels right. You feel like that, that has to be. I can't imagine not living that particular way in my life. Or, or how about this? How about with your commitments? Do you ever let your heart make commitments that your schedule and your abilities can't keep, right? You know, there's another saying for that. I, I can say it because we're a church family. Do you ever let your emotions write checks that your butt can't cash? You know what I'm talking about? I know you do. I know you make these commitments in the heat of the moment, and then you're like, ooh, wish I hadn't done And here's how I know it that we will often have people on a Sunday morning sign up. That, you know, we've talked about a need in the nursery or Kids Creek or Center Point, or We have these needs and we're trying to get people to sign up for. And like 50 people will sign up they want to serve, right? And then Monday morning we start calling them. We have about eight of them actually answer the phone, right? The rest of them go. So not, not bad people. They just were caught up in the emotion and didn't stop to think, is that the best place for me to serve? Do I really have Time, emotions can do that. Or how about this? This is the big one. Fear. How much of your life is being controlled or manipulated by fear? And by the way, do you know how fear most frequently shows up in our lives? Anger. You understand anger is a secondary emotion. When you feel angry, it is usually because you're either of fear frustration, or hurt. So much of what I see among Christ followers and engaging in the lostness and the brokenness and all the 
weird chaos in our culture, most of what I see on Facebook responding to that is fear disguised as anger. If you're going to live out worship, you don't need to hide your passions. You don't need to try to be less emotional. You just need to put your passions under control of God's Spirit and in alignment with the truth of God's Word. Make sense? Last one, number three. Sometimes I can worship with my head and my heart, but no hands. No hands. This is what I call being so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. Right? I'm so caught up in my Bible study and my fellowship group and worshiping and loving Jesus and all of that that I forget to let that impact how I treat people around me. It's interesting when Jesus answers the question about the greatest commandment and he answers with the Shema prayer, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus doesn't stop there. He adds, the second is equal to it, love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, not in the Shema. It's not part of Exodus 6. That phrase, love your neighbor as you love yourself, is a tiny little obscure law in the book of laws known as Leviticus. Everybody had heard the first part of that. Nobody probably really understood the second part of it, love your neighbor as yourself. And I believe Jesus adds that to help make sure we as Christ followers know that you can't separate your love for God with the way you treat others or what you are willing to do to help others. What's an example of that in the New Testament? Well, to me, I immediately thought of the rich young ruler. Maybe you know that story. We don't know the guy's real name. We just know he's wealthy, powerful, uh, and he comes up to Jesus looking for something. Notice Mark 10. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man raced up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Couple things I want you to notice in there. Notice the way he approaches Jesus. He runs up to him and falls immediately on his knees before him. You need to understand, in first century Jewish culture, grown people didn't run. Rich people didn't kneel before anyone but God. The point is, this is not one of the other religious leaders trying to trick Jesus with a question. This is a guy who's humble and genuine and truly wants to know where life is. My point is, this guy's heart is in the right place. And then secondly, look at what he says to Jesus. He says, good teacher. Nobody else called Jesus that. The Pharisees who wanted to trick Jesus, they just called him teacher. Jesus' disciples just called him teacher, rabbi, rabboni. This guy says, good teacher. In fact, Jesus makes a big deal out of that. Jesus is like, why are you calling me good? Isn't there only one who is good referring to God? My point is, this guy knows who Jesus is. Right? This guy's mind, his head, is in the right place. He's got a good heart. He goes to the right person because he's got the right thinking. And, of course, you know the rest of the story, right? Jesus said, you want eternal life? Just obey the commands of Moses. The guy's like, which ones? Well, you know the big ones. Love, you know, love your parents, honor your parents, don't murder, don't commit adultery. Just, and he's like, dude, I've done that since I was a child. I'm good to go on following the rules. And Jesus said, that's great. Just do one more thing. Go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. And notice the response, Mark 10, 22. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. You know, we read this, and we think this is about money and stuff and about loving God more than I love money and stuff. And certainly... This is a part of this interaction is about money and stuff. But I believe it is also a picture of our need to align our heads and our hearts with our hands. To worship God with all that we have been given by God. Right? Remember, Jesus didn't say, just go sell all you have and come and follow me. 
What did he say? Go sell all your possessions and give it to who? The poor, right? Help others. Use what God has given you to bless and help others. Now listen, I'm not saying for you to worship fully, you need to leave today, go give everything you have to the poor. But I am saying you got to live open-handed. You got to live open-handed. Worship is so much more than just showing up in here, raising your hands in a song, an expression of surrender. Worship is living this way, living your life surrendered to God and trusting Him for your next breath, your next meal, your next house payment. Trust Him more than you trust yourself. Trust Him more than you trust what you feel in the moment. Trust Him more than your own abilities to take care of yourself or to fix a community or fix a family or to fix a nation. At its heart, worship is about surrendering all of me to all of God. Head, heart, and hand. Pray with me. I'm just going to ask you right where you are, just close your eyes for a minute. Let's, whatever's going on, whatever you're thinking about, let's kind of remove distractions. And I, I just want to ask you, what's a next step for you look like? Is, is there some place you've just felt today, this morning, through the power of God's Word and His Spirit in you? Is there something you need to do to worship God a little more fully? Do you maybe need to spend some more time digging into God's Word to really know the truth so that you're not controlled by your emotions? Or maybe is there some place you need to serve? Some place you need to put your hands to work? Is there a heart issue somewhere where Late at night, when you're finally really honest with yourself and with God, you recognize your heart maybe has drifted. Your affections, your desires are for things other than God. Are there maybe some idols in your life? Maybe a next step for you might be a first step in your faith journey, to go public with your faith through baptism. I I don't know what your next step is. But I do know that we are called to worship God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and our strength to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So Jesus, would you help us have the courage to change the things we need to change about ourselves to get our hearts, our minds, our eyes, everything in us focused on you and filter our lives through the truth of your word. Move among your people, Jesus, today, I ask. In your name, amen.